Hey everybody, this is Robert Guest with Guest and Gray. I'm here with Jose Noriega, and we're going to do a little presentation on a recent appellate case uh, from the Dallas Court of Appeals. Uh, say something, Jose. Robert, um, thank you for having me on here, uh, even though I'm your employee. Uh, so, so let's go, go through this uh, case, yep. and uh, hopefully we can learn a couple things about hearsay and uh, you know, sufficiency of evidence standards, things of that nature. You know, Jose, I bet we can. And, um, you know, besides employees, I like to think that we're also just best buddies. Here goes. <laughs> and I got to say that. Spiritual leader, actually. Bef before we start, Jose was completely against me doing a whole PowerPoint slide on just one case. He thought this was a bad idea. So if it doesn't go well, he was right. And so what case is it? It's going to be John Wheeler versus State. It's a very recent case, as in, it came out on April 15th, but like any good case, it says do, do not publish, which for appellate lawyers, you know, it means something. And also, if you're going to cite it, don't cite it in court as precedent because they can get mad at you for that. But um, it's, not. It's, not, it's not. It'll look it'll go really bad. Um, it's a burglary case out of the 283rd in Dallas. Mr. Wheeler got 70 years because he had some two enhancements here, which um, let's go to the facts. Um, Jose, go over, you want to go over the facts? Want to do this? Sure. So, um, Mr. Wheeler, uh, was accused of, or there was a stolen forerunner from a residence, uh, security cameras showed a white male's walk, white male walking around the house. The vehicle was found in an apartment complex with the parking pass inside the, uh, the parking pass had a handicap, uh, number and, and date or, uh, an apartment number and date. And the person, uh, in the apartment is an associate of the defendant. So. Um, it looks like the uh, defendant was ID'd through an apartment complex worker. Um, Don't skip the last sentence on there. Don't skip that. Also, the most important sentence, which I hope everyone <laughs> is telling their defendants, do not make jail calls. Avoid oh, the phone man. call um, because that seems to really get the defendant in this case quite a bit. Um, yeah, these are awful, I'm man. And so your guy's stuck in jail, right? And... He wants to talk to people in the outside world and they want to know about his case. And you can tell your client, you're like, dude, don't talk about the case. But what, what else are they going to talk about? Right. They don't have a lot going on. And so he takes some calls and he makes some statements and we'll end up going over those in a minute. But it's something where we always tell our clients, they record your calls. Don't talk about it. They read your letters. You know, don't talk. Don't talk about the case. Um, but it happens and it does come up during trial and it's frustrating. But it happened in this case. And so we're going to go over that. But the first thing um, Mr. Wheeler brought up on appeal or his attorney did was that there's not enough evidence here to convict me or uphold the conviction. And this is not an uncommon argument. Oh, Siri's trying to talk to me, but it's really hard to win on this. And one reason is because the standard is so bad. And so if you're going to argue on appeal that this is not a strong enough case for me to be convicted. Um, you need to know what the standard is and why it's really difficult to make. And so it says a standard review. Uh, first, it's viewing all the evidence and light most favorable to the verdict. And so what was the verdict? It's guilty. And so you review all the evidence from the trial, you know, um, assuming that, well, it looks like he's guilty, right? And then could any rational trier of fact um, found the essential elements beyond a reasonable doubt. And so we're not saying like the world's most brilliant jury member, you know, or uh, could have said this guy's guilty. It's could any rational person. And so setting the bar rational really isn't making it tough for the state on appeal. And a lot of defendants, though, when they get convicted, they're like, there's no evidence here. This is BS. That's a really common phrase. And they want their appellate lawyer to go in there and say, this is like the innocence project. But in Texas on appeal, it's kind of a losing um, argument. Here's some more about it. Jose, you want to go over this one? Yeah, so um, evidence can be considered that's direct and, uh, and circumstantial evidence are equally prohibitive. Circumstantial evidence alone can be enough to convict the person. Um, quite frankly, they'll, they'll make up quite a bit of evidence um, and rational inferences. If you've ever seen these appellate, if you've ever seen these appellate decisions, they will Oh, well, they could have done this and this and this, even arguments that weren't made in front of the jury, they will rationalize and assume that a jury believed that argument, even though it wasn't really presented, quite frankly. Um, 
I know Robert and I were joking yesterday when we were preparing for this that um, there's two types of error, right? Preserved and harmless, or unpreserved and harmless. Waved, um, waved, waved and harmless. Yeah. So we're going to get into that too. There's going to be some harmless error in this case. Um, th this next sentence here too talks about the evidence to uphold a conviction on appeal doesn't have to defeat, you know, every other um, possibility for how the crime was committed. And so in this case, they're going to have um, some defense arguments and it's, these are what the defense argued on appeal. And it says, well, at trial, the state did not call the maintenance worker who saw the defendant. Um, they found a driver's license in the car, the stolen car that belonged to somebody else. This person wasn't investigated. And so um, that person did testify though. And they said, well, I, I lost my driver's license. The detective didn't seek other security videos. They didn't fingerprint the vehicle and the detective's testimony, which to me, I, we always wish this was more big a deal because we're like, there's an affidavit, you swear to it and it's not true. And this is the lead detective on the case, but even that's not going to be enough. And we're going to go through that in a second. And so the appellate court says, you know, we get it, but you're going to lose. Why? Because arguments on contrary theories, um, that's great, but we're going to defer to the jurors who already convicted your guy. And so you lose. And you don't have to, again, um, defeat every conceivable defense argument to be upheld, upheld on appeal. And it's great to bring those up, but it's not... It's hard to win, man. And uh, factual sufficiency is just, it's one of the most difficult challenges. It, it's made a lot. And I wonder, and Jose, maybe you can speak to this. I wonder if one of the reasons it's made is kind of some client service that they like seeing, you know, that their defense lawyer on appeal is going, hey, this is a weak case or these are the problems. But it's not always something where you can go in there and actually change a verdict. Yeah. You know, I mean, what is it like less than one percent of factual sufficiency arguments actually get overturned and or overturn the verdict i don't it's not a very common thing by any means i think it is something that um you know it's kind of hey i'm gonna write this and appease you appease your client um and you know just to make sure that it's not going to happen i think it does work really well in kind of um in situations where you know the, they just completely forgot an element right like um, you know, but at that point, generally the judge should instruct, you know, for a not guilty verdict as opposed to uh, that. So I don't see this happening very often. Uh, they do file them a sufficiency evidence of the evidence pretty commonly, but it's just not overturned very often. Well, and what what we see too is, and you know, people contact our office and they'll go, "My boyfriend, husband, whatever, fiance was convicted." And the evidence isn't strong. There's all these defenses, you know, this is going to be so easy <laughs> to overturn on appeal because he's innocent and you have to give him the bad news that I'm sorry, but you can have a strong defense. But if the jury rejects your defense at trial, appeal isn't the easiest way to get it overturned. I mean, it's the hardest way. And so um, I know it's frustrating for clients because they think, well, an appeal should be another shot to challenge evidence. And it's just not. The evidence is what it is on appeal. And it's even worse than that. The evidence is what the verdict, which is guilty if you're appealing, um, you know, it supports that. So the, the court of appeals is going to say, well, at trial, if you brought up a defense and the jury says guilty, that means they rejected it. And we're not going to rethink what the jury did. But um, let's talk about denying mistrials, because I know when I first started going to defense lawyer CLEs and they taught us about preserving error, they said, well, if you want to object to trial to like any kind of evidentiary rejection, like hearsay, irrelevance, authentication, and the judge grants it, sustains it, you have to ask for a mistrial, right? I don't know. Do you remember that, Jose? Yeah, it's, it's it was one of the weirdest things for me is just, you know, well, you granted my objection. Like, why do I have to ask for a limiting instruction and then a mistrial and then, you know, thing, things of that nature? It's it's very odd. And they would And they would tell you that if you don't ask for a mistrial, you've basically waived the error. And so you end up at trial, if you ever win an objection, which can be hard, um, you have to go, well, I want the whole trial to start over now and thrown out. And that's usually gonna get denied on an evidentiary objection. And so um, if you do object and you do ask for a mistrial, you have preserved error for appeal. And Jose mentioned earlier that there's two types of error on appeal, waived and harmless. Well, if you don't ask for a mistrial, even if the judge sustains your objection, the state's gonna go, you waived that, man, you wanted that error to happen. You don't care. 
And so let's talk about mistrial. So you're in trial and your lawyer goes, objection, sustained, and then defense goes, I want a mistrial. The judge goes, no way, denied. Well, this says, ordinarily a prompt instruction to disregard or cure every error associated with an improper question. A uh, mistrial is only appropriate when the objectional event is emotionally inflammatory and curative instructions won't prevent the jury from being unfairly prejudiced against the defendant. So um, let's say there's a hearsay objection and the hearsay gets out in front of the jury. You know, this person told me X. The defense goes, objection, hearsay. And the judge goes, whatever that witness said, forget that. And what do, what do lawyers say? You can't unring a bell, you know? Well, you can tell the jury to forget they heard that, but how do you know they do it? You have really no way of knowing that. And it's kind of frustrating because it's kind of like the evidence that shouldn't have got in, got in. And you just have to roll with it and hope the jury doesn't think about it. And the more you bring it up or say, hey, the judge said you can't consider that evidence, the more you're highlighting that evidence, which should have been kept out. And so uh, mistrial denials are, it's frustrating and your remedies are not great. Um, Jose, do you want to talk about, let's talk about hearsay. So everyone should know what hearsay is. And, um, you know, hearsay is one of those tough things. I mean, there's a million exceptions to it. Plus when you've got hearsay, you've got also confrontation issues when it, when it comes to a criminal case. And so, um, hearsay, you have to be on the lookout for, and, and everything, quite frankly, anytime you have any type of written or, or verbal statement, um, any type of test results, <laughs> things of that nature, just always be on the lookout for hearsay and your client's right to confront. And so this question, this is to the detective. And so they go, hey, detective, as part of your investigation, did you get information corroborating your belief that the defendant lived at the address, which is the apartment involved where they found the, the apartment parking pass? And he's like, yeah, totally. Well, the defense lawyer knows what that information is, right? He knows that's hearsay that someone told you this. And so um, he's going to object because they're just kind of backdoor getting this information in that, you know, hey, uh, here's a conclusion of the hearsay without saying who told me the thing. And um, you're thinking, well, that's not fair. That's just another way to get hearsay in. And you'd be right. But it's also not a good objection because we have so much bad case law, um, which says, well, if the police <laughs> are going to testify about how an investigation began, and how a defendant became, you know, a suspect, that's not going to be hearsay. And I think what they're kind of getting at is also the state of mind exception, which says, you know, hey, this isn't offered for the truth of the matter asserted. This is to show your state of mind. But their state of mind is your defendant did the crime, you know, yeah. and it is being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Because I would object that, okay, because the state will go judge. This isn't for the truth of the matter asserted. And then I go, well, then it's irrelevant. If it's not true, who cares? Like, who cares what it is? Like, why would we let something in that's definitely not true? And I've been offered for being true, but it's it's such a uh, kind of just a script at this point. The state knows exactly what to say. And there's, you know, our court of appeals have been really pro state for a while. And so they've got some of this case law side here on their side. Well, um, and then Robert, here's Jose's to, point too. And, and to the, to go back <laughs> to that um, kind of that sentence, it's, it's scary when you think about it as far as like an assault call, right? I mean, they can bring in the fact that they got a report that someone beat the shit out of someone else. Yeah. Um, and, we got a report that your guy did the crime. <laughs> yeah, you know, and we're already, they're already looking for him. Like, oh, well, crap. I mean, why don't we just convict him right then and there? Come on. Yeah. yeah. I got a report that your defendant did the offense. And so I went to investigate whether he did the offense. And I corroborated my belief that he did the offense. And it's all hearsay. And so it all, I mean, a lot of it gets in this way. And so you need to object, not just hearsay, if they say it's not true, then say it's irrelevant. Then also confrontation, 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 which gets into testimonial issues, which are kind of beyond this. But um, it just shows how stacked this thing is against defendants in Texas. And so jail calls, oh man. So this guy's on the phone. Let's go over this. Jose, you want to take this one? Um, sure. So um, the recording, just to hear it verbatim, the one in Addison, that that dude don't have nothing but a film of me walking beside a house. What the hell is that supposed to do? In, in the second recording, he says, you know, the video that they say that they have, oh my God, it doesn't. It shows me, it, it, it shows what appears to be a white male walk by the front of a house. That's it. So doesn't flat out come out and say like, I did the crime. However, does 
talk about the evidence and in a very questionable manner, right? Um, that's at least my take on it. And I'd be worried if I was the defense attorney and I'm having to go against the, those two statements, quite frankly. Well, and it can at least be argued that he puts himself there because he says, that's me walking beside the house. So if your defense is the dude on the video isn't the defendant, this looks yeah. pretty bad. And you got to know the defense lawyer when they get this is going, dude, what are you Just doing? Shut man? Up. Just shut and, up. <laughs> and what, what, what would your defendant say though? Jose knows they would say, well, I, I'm saying I didn't do it though. I'm saying I'm innocent. And they go, no, to a jury, this looks like you're putting yourself there. And so it's really frustrating. And it's one of the advantages among others, a state has like in any other lawsuit, you know, like a civil lawsuit, one side doesn't get to lock up the other side until the trial happens. But in criminal law it happens all the time. Like the state has your guy locked in a cage. They're controlling all of his communications and it's a huge advantage and it really kind of rigs the game for the state. But um, <clears throat> the defense objection was, well, you can't authenticate this. And this kind of goes into how Dallas County does their jail calls where if you're an inmate, you get a number, you put in the number to the phone. And so these calls are made from that number, but um, what's authentication? It's it's saying this evidence is what the state says it is. So the state's saying this is the defendant on the phone. And so to satisfy an authentication objection, which is the defense objection, they have to produce evidence to support a finding that it is what it is. And audio recordings um, may be based on what's in the conversation. So someone's talking about kind of what's in this case, and they're saying, well, that can be enough. And the thing that defense lawyers hear a lot, which is frustrating, frustrating. It's what what is this judge going to say, Jose? Let me see if you can guess what the judge is going to say. When you object authentication and they go, well, this is and this. And the judge says, well, I'm going to let it in. That can go to the what and not the, the what. The lovely yes. weight, of, weight of the evidence. Not and, the admissibility, just the weight. Yeah. And even then, I've had in TBC type situations or in open plea, I've had the judge just flat out ask the authentication questions. Like, do you have yeah. any reason to believe that this is not correct? And it's like, I mean, yeah, I don't is, have a reason, but I just haven't, I don't know. <laughs> and so, it, what, okay, what Jose is saying is judges will shift the burden. They'll go, well, defense lawyer, and it, tell me this is not what it's supposed to be. And you're going, well, that's not the standard. Like, if you're, uh, if you're presenting evidence, you know, the state's presenting these phone calls, the burden's on them to show it's admissible. So if you object, they should have to meet this. And judges in Texas, and we've had it happen, will go, well, defense lawyer, tell me tell me why this isn't what it's supposed to be. And you go, well, that's not how it works. <laughs> that's not the standard. They have to prove it is. And um, so here's on appeal. Let's say you object to that, right? And you get all the way here. There's Siri again. Um, the trial court couldn't conclude that these are authenticated, that they explained how the system works in the jail, that you get a PIN number and all this. And so they go through it. And the calls, and here's why you tell your defendant, don't talk about your case. Even to say you're innocent, don't talk about the case. It includes facts relevant to the case, including video content, you know. And so um, I guess it came out that in Dallas, they sometimes share their PIN numbers to try to call people. But the court could have concluded this is okay. And so your takeaway for everyone who's got a loved one in jail is don't have them tell you how innocent they are of, of the case. Because even that will, will hurt them. Um, one of the... I don't yeah. have many clients in jail and I know neither one of us have many clients in jail, but one of the things that I do tell them is, Hey, if you have to talk about the case, the only thing that you should say is, Hey, tell my attorney to come visit me to any family member or anything like that. I don't, I don't take jail phone calls. I know you don't as well, just because there's so many things with the secure systems, for instance, and all these jails recording um, attorney client um, conversations that, it just shouldn't be done, quite frankly. Um, it, it's nice to be able to, you know, talk to them whenever they want, but just practically speaking, I'm not about to give the state my entire theory of a case over a phone call. And no, I know and there's been there's been situations where it's come out that the state's recorded the defendant and his lawyer, and they're like, "Oh, we're really sorry. We promise we didn't listen to it." And you're going, "The sheriff has had my conversations the whole time." Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I'd like to believe that the prosecutor didn't listen to it and everything like that, but even just the initial part is a violation of the attorney client privilege. Um, yeah. And whatever happens to him though, does anyone ever get in trouble for that for recording no. lawyers? Never, never, no. ever. No. And so if, if I like bugged the DA's office, you know, it would be a problem, right? But if they record us while well, they keep our client locked up pretrial and he can't get out, that's fine. No one cares. And it's, it, you know, there's a reason. I mean, one reason not to take jail calls is they're expensive, right? The other one is it's dangerous. 
it's not a good idea. And even if your defendant's going to say, I didn't do it, you know, the whole time, if he puts himself anywhere near the situation, they're going to go, Oh, look, you're there. Yeah. So it's frustrating. Defense works hard. Um, spoilation. Let's talk about this. Let's say you have a case and evidence is missing, right? And people rightfully believe, well, that's a big deal. That should help the defendant if there's some missing evidence, because we've all seen, you know, some Netflix show where there's missing evidence and it turns out to exonerate the defendant. In Texas, it doesn't really make a difference on appeal. They're going to go, meh, missing evidence. Who cares? And the thing is, the state, 99% of the time, 99.99% .99 of the time has the, the evidence, right? At some point or all of it, they get to gather it, they get to keep it. And so if you're going to object to missing evidence, it's called spoilation. And it's one of those situations where if you're in a civil lawsuit, if you're like Exxon suing some, you know, some dude like spoilation, you can get instruction. It's a bigger deal than it is if you're looking at going to prison. And so you've got to show a couple of things that the state lost the evidence and also that it was in bad faith, which you can never show. Um, I think the bad faith is, is the hardest part. The, the, the one it's easier to show, not with prosecutors. It's easier to show with, you know, um, sheriff or police departments, but with prosecutors, it's going to be next to impossible to show, um, you know, unless you've had, you have evidence that it's been sitting on their desk before or something on those lines. And but it's you, just you can't very, even, very, very difficult. You can't even show negligence and yeah. You got to show, well, you destroyed it on purpose so that you, you know, deframe my client or something. I mean, it is the most impossible standard. Like, you know, if there's a video and it just gets lost, well, you don't get anything for that. The defense gets nothing, you know, and it, th there's no remedy for you. And so if you're the state and you have, then, you know, there's some evidence that could help the defendant, it's your best bet to just put it in a pile and lose it. And then like, just go, I don't know what happened to it. And the defense can't get through that. If, if if some person just says, "Hey, I lost it," you know, well, I don't know what happened. The dog ate my homework. How are you going to get him to admit that you know they did it on part? It's never going to happen. And so, unless someone in law enforcement is going to confess to framing your client, you know, the spoilation um, doesn't really have a remedy. And so, besides proving bad faith, which is impossible in Texas, the evidence has to be material. Which, if you can't see it because it's gone, you can't prove it's material. And so, uh, it has to be exculpatory before it was destroyed. And so. If there's a missing video, right, that you never got in discovery and it can exonerate your client, you have to know that before they lost it and they have to have lost it, like basically as an illegal act of, you know, evidence tampering. So it's just another thing that really frustrates defense lawyers. Um, one possible sanction is a jury instruction. So you can go, hey, judge, I want the jury to be instructed that if there's missing evidence, it could exonerate my client. Um, so what happened in this case? Jose, you want to go over this? <clears throat> um, sure. So the uh, arrest warrant that contained facts from the detective, um, the affidavit, uh, I'm just gonna read the affidavit. It's a lot easier than me sur surmising it. Uh, the CW provided a copy of surveillance videos, video of the offense to the police. So defendant is a person seen on video entering the garage and talking er, and, and taking the vehicle without the CW's consent. And so an affidavit though, for people that don't know, somebody swore to this, they go, this is definitely true. This is so true. Like I'm going to sign and swear to this. And I think it was either the search warrant or arrest warrant affidavit. Right. And so it's not just some minor thing where this guy just said, Hey man. And so he's making statements that these videos a exist and B show a certain thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, what happens at trial? Right. So, uh, Jose, tell him what happened at trial. So they do not exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that doesn't show the videos come yeah, in, right? And it doesn't show it, any of this stuff. It doesn't. It doesn't show any of this stuff. It's uh, you know, kind of a there's a last video that shows a forerunner going back and down the driveway, but it doesn't um, allow any identification of who the person is or anything like that. So um, it's just kind of you know, it's the exact opposite of quite frankly what the detective swore to, but. I mean, I think we've all seen that before numerous times. And so the defense is arguing judge. He swore that there's videos that existed that show these things. And here are all the videos and none of them have this. And so what are your conclusions, right? And one of them is, I mean, no one's going to say it, I guess. I don't know if they said it at a trial or not, but the guy wasn't telling the truth or like he maybe made a mistake in what was on the videos. And but so um, those are two... And one of the really, the things that I like is the way the state responded to it. Like, oh, judge, well, you haven't even demonstrated that the uh, videos existed. Like, what? Like, yeah. so, uh, so you don't even believe your own police officer's affidavit? Yes. Is that what you're basically saying? 
This is the state's uh, witness, their detective saying, I swear this is true. And they're going, Judge, they haven't even proven this is true yet. Who can believe our detective? And if you're the defendant looking at 70 years or who got that, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, this is a big deal, right? Like that if the state's saying you can't even believe the detective. Well, no, those are the kind of arguments you can make on appeal and go, our witness isn't even credible. Like, and you'll can get by with that in Texas. Yeah. And so yeah. they'll, they'll so rely that, on that witness's testimony to prove he's guilty, but then you know, when it's not convenient for them, it's fine. I don't know. Like, yeah, we don't know if that was true, but yeah, we'll on believe appeal, everything it's like, else he said. It's like, who's this guy on appeal? We don't even know him. Who trusts, who trusts uh, that guy? That affidavit's nothing. And so what's, what's thing? Based on the record, the court have concluded that no videos ever existed. So get this, man. On appeal, the court of appeal says the trial court, the trial judge could say a swine, a, a swine, a signed sworn statement from the detective doesn't prove anything, which... Yeah. You're spo that's supposed to prove probable cause to get an arrest warrant or the search warrant. So I'm like, man, if that was a search warrant, yeah. you have like, a, you get like a hearing on that? You can have like a Franks or something. But I am kind of curious to see if there was ever, you know, a motion to produce <clears throat> filed, some type of discovery motion filed in this case. Um, just, I, I don't think Michael Morton says you have to. I think just the demand itself is sufficient, but. Um, you know, always best practices it, it would be to say, hey, look, I, I do see that there's videos in this. Either they produce them within 20 days or, you know, they're not allowed to testify to that um, material. And so th this line, too, should just kind of scare everybody. And this is some more case law. But um, because the video is unknown, we don't know what's on it, right? To obtain relief, you have to show bad faith. And this is just shows you that it's impossible. You're never going to show it. It's a joke of a standard. Improper motives such as personal animus against the defendants or desire to prevent them from attaining useful. How are you going to prove that? How are you going to prove a detective's state of mind or the state's witness or anybody unless they just confess that you're right? I hate this guy. I mean, they're trying to put him in prison. Obviously, I don't like this guy, but you got to say, well, no, it's even more that's personal. Like they went to high school together and like they're mad at each other over some <laughs> stuff. Like you're, you're never going to yeah. show it, man. And so, I mean, bar barring a flat out confession <clears throat> from the detective saying, I flat out lied on this instead of oh well i just must have mistakenly seen something but it wasn't what i thought it was which is probably what he's going to testify to i mean let's let's be perfectly honest well that's my last slide jose you got anything else you want to add about this no just um just to kind of conclude things a little bit um and recap number one talk to your clients about jail phone calls um, I, I think we all hate getting those, you know, uh, flash drives full of thousands of phone calls. I was in a um, injury to a child causing death case, and I'm not even kidding you. We had 70, 80 hours worth of phone calls that we had to listen to. And we just kept getting more and more as the trial was progressing. It was like a two week long trial. And it seemed like almost every night we'd get another email like, oh, we found, you know, there's more phone calls. And uh, it ended up not helping our client very much, but, um, you know, that's kind of number one. Number two, bad faith is incredibly difficult to show in Texas. Um, you know, you're better off evaluating the evidence, what they, what you think and shouldn't file a motion based on that and see if you can get the judge to exclude that testimony. Uh, depending on where you are, some judges will, will do that. Um, other judges and, you know, more conservative counties probably won't do you know where they just flat out get to exclude evidence right um based on no and they'll, and they'll tell you well you can cross-examine him on it and you're like but he's yeah. the guy who lost the evidence like what's he gonna yeah. say it's it's almost a useless remedy to go hey did you have that did you lose it you know like yeah i lost it i mean it's 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 a position that's so frustrating when you could just say hey the state has a standard to not lose evidence or when they swear that something exists in an affidavit, there should, you know, a, they should maybe not do that, you know, but those can't be the rules that would make it too hard. Instead, the rules are, you have to show that you were framed on purpose, <laughs> you know, intentionally, and the detective has to confess to it and you're never, you're never going to get it. And so really any remedy is better than what we have now, which is nothing. Um, but I just know like in civil cases, I think it's a more robust spoilation example, but um, I'm not, well, in I mean, civil I cases, you get it with a just flat out, you know, spoilation letter and you just send them that and, oh, they didn't preserve this. Well, we're going to give you a great instruction based on that. Yeah, in criminal have cases, at least that have, same standard. Really? Yeah. In 
criminal cases, we have that Michael Morton that we're supposed to just demand, you know, mm. request all the evidence and we're supposed to get it. But, oh, if we don't get it on time, oh, that's on us. Oh, sorry. It's fine. You know, what does reasonable time mean? Apparently, you know, the day before trial, that's fine. So a couple of things about this. One is um, these appeals in Dallas, um, you can also apply if, you, if you're the defendant and you lose, you can apply to the, the Supreme Court for criminal cases, which we call the Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, in Texas, we have two separate, like, kind of final courts for appellate purposes. And you can ask them to review this. It's called a, you know, file a PDR, Petition for Discretionary Review, and say, hey, here are the issues. They don't take many of those. Um, but beyond that, and maybe file some kind of writ, I mean, that's the only remedies that this defendant would have left. And so, I mean, I'm not saying the trial lawyer did, did anything wrong. I'm not second guessing anything, but it's just, this is to show how you can think I've got a good issue here you know, or, or like a person who's not a criminal lawyer will go, that shouldn't happen. That doesn't sound fair. But when you try to appeal it and get relief, you're just going to be frustrated because there's so many ways to go. That doesn't really matter. No one really cares, you know, and it's so frustrating because it's a situation where I think if we're arguing over money, like if there was a jury verdict for, you know, a billion dollars against some big corporation, they would find a reason to throw that out. But these Absolutely. jury verdicts are not to be touched, right? And that's a very kind of, I, I think of it as kind of results-oriented jurisprudence where criminal defendants are supposed to lose, but like giant corporate defendants are supposed to win. And it's just a matter of, you know, we like one more than the other. So any yeah, last words, Ex- Jose? If it was, at, if, if it was mm-hmm. Exxon versus Joe Schmo, Joe Schmo, you know, would have lost this case a, a million times over. Um, and that's kind of the way that the Court of Criminal Appeals looks at it, just to reiterate that, um, you know, state of Texas wins 99.9% of the time, you know, well, Joe Schmo loses 99.9% of the time. Well, and if you look at the quarter of criminal appeals again, not just to pick on these guys, but most of them have spent their, their careers doing what prosecuting, right. And they were elected mm-hmm. to be the most conservative prosecutor, state friendly, like they run on the, those kind of stuff, right? Like who's the most tough on whatever. And, and you get, case all like this. And so if you're thinking you watch some Netflix show about how the innocent guy went to prison, you go, how could that ever happen? The system shouldn't allow that. Well, this is how you get there by saying nothing that happens at a trial is going to overturn a conviction. Who really cares? These are just awful defendants. Um, and that's how you get it. That's why when I, when I see some Netflix show on the innocent guy going to prison, my level of surprise is zero because, you know, we take mistakes at trial and even stuff like missing evidence. It's not taken seriously here. And um, it's a, it makes it so hard for defense lawyers. That's why this job is so challenging. And even on appeal, when you're like, man, maybe the appellate court, you know, it's still hard to get relief. And so um, I'm not saying this guy's innocent. He didn't do the thing. You know, I don't know. I'm just saying if you're not going to have rules that can keep out bad evidence or, you know, um, that, that even make it where we're presumed innocent, then you're going to get situations where innocent people will get convicted. It won't be hard to do. And so um, that's a final word on this case. Um, thanks for joining in. And, we're going to try to do some more of these um, with Jose. And if you have a case, you have a criminal case, you have a criminal question, you know, we can help you with appeals or trials or, you know, burglary of, of vehicle charges. You know, Jose's, um, he goes around Dallas and we go to Kaufman, Rockwall, Collin County. But you can call Guest in Grade 972-564-4644. Thank you very much. Thank you all.